Hey, thanks for joining us today on this episode of God is Not a Theory with Ken Fish. I'm your host, Grant Pemberton. We're going to be unpacking a lot of deliverance questions today that have been sent in by listeners. We hope you enjoy it. And if you have specific questions, be sure to send those in as well so we can get to those. Thanks for listening, and we hope you enjoy today's episode. Hey, we're back with uh, with Ken, and uh, in this these next few episodes, we're going to be talking uh, about the questions that you guys have submitted, and uh, and so we're gonna we're gonna blow through some things, and and we're a lot a lot of questions about demons. Not a lot of people know a lot about demons. Uh, Hollywood has taught most of us about demons. Uh, and not the scriptures. And, uh, you know, if, if we've spent any time listening to what you're putting out, Ken, um, a lot of it has to do with a deliverance uh, type of uh, a focus. And um, which I think is, is part of the reason why we're all so interested to hear what you say is because that's just hard to find. And we've gotten a lot of questions um, about demons. Now, having hung out with you multiple times and spending a lot of time uh, I know your ministry and your focus uh, is not nearly as zeroed in on the demonic and deliverance as a lot of people think it is. Um, you know, you're a scholar, uh, historian, uh, all of that sort of thing. And I, I don't think that you, I mean, we've had talks where you, you don't want to be the deliverance guy. <laughs> That's not what you want to bill yourself as. Uh, but by golly, you just, you just seem to know quite a bit about it. And um and, and not a lot of people are talking about it. And so I preface that to say, uh, we're going to, we're not going to spend, you know, every episode in this podcast, uh, talking about demons and where they come, how to get rid of them, all that sort of thing, because there's, there's quite a bit more, uh, depth that I think we're going to get into as well, but nevertheless, so many questions about demons. So, uh, I just wanted you get, get ready, Ken. We're going to do some rapid fire demon questions. Okay. Um, so the, the big, we, you touched on it in, in one of the previous episodes. Let's talk about this idea of idolatry. Uh, you know, it, the scriptures talk about meats sacrificed to idols. Um, that's probably not as prevalent if you're listening in the West. Uh, as far as food, literal food that you're eating, sacrifice to idols. There's been a lot of talk in mainstream evangelical stuff about idolatry. Uh, you know, honestly, like um, idols of the heart and all of that sort of thing. And so I think we have a framework for idolatry that that gets in the way of Jesus and, and, and the gospel. But I don't know if we have a framework of idolatry from a supernatural spiritual stance. So in other words... You know, if you're reading books, um, you know, by Tim Keller or by whoever, I mean, there's a lot of, of gospeling people with and talking about idolatry, idol, idols of the heart, and uh, it's good stuff. But there's another side to that coin uh, that's actual spiritual ramifications, not just, um, you know, uh, uh, causing us to, to fall in our walk to Jesus, but there are demonic strongholds behind uh idolatry right that is correct and so um just because we may not be eating meats sacrificed to idols i think paul is probably making a broader point there could you could you speak to that yeah um you know to do it i kind of need to pull out my bible and read a little bit of it uh because most people would not be familiar enough with the passage to pull it up from memory. And in any case, I find that very few people memorize scripture anymore. And so they have a general sense of what it says. But then when you get down to the specifics, um, a lot of times people want to debate that because they don't actually know what's embedded there. But in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church and he's addressing the topic of idolatry. Now, you have to remember, Corinth sits at the uh, southern end of the Greek uh, peninsula, and it, it, it was a notoriously licentious city. 
and of course this is Greece. They were no longer in in the Jewish homeland, and so Id- idols are everywhere. You know, in in his journey south, he had gone through Athens, and Athens today is maybe ninety minutes or maybe as much as two hours by car from Corinth. So call it a hundred miles or thereabouts, maybe one hundred and twenty miles. But um, you know, he he in Athens he had said, men of Athens, I see that in every respect you are very religious. And as I walked around, I saw idols of every kind, and I even saw one to an unknown god. You didn't, just in case you forgot somebody, you put up an idol to that guy. So this is the context that he's speaking into. And so these Corinthian Christians are people who had been birthed into idolatry. They didn't, they didn't know anything different. They were polytheists. They worshiped blocks of stone and carvings of wood and maybe in the more upscale areas, or if, depending on which god it was, maybe they'd ca- cast them out of silver or gold. Um, we, we know that Paul ran into this exact issue um, in Ephesus, where Artemis of the Ephesians was uh, worshipped. Well, Artemis was the Greek god Diana. She was the goddess of the moon, the goddess of love, and the goddess of the hunt. So she was one hot chick, right? And so you can imagine what those idols looked like. And Listen, the Greeks had it all figured out. They knew how to carve stone and how to mold metal to make it look exactly like human body parts. And if you see some of the things that are on exhibit in museums today from, you know, from, the, from that era, maybe 2000, 2300, 2500, 2700 years ago, there's nothing left of the imagination. I mean, they knew how to reproduce the nose, the eyes, the hair, the eyelashes, obviously the sexual body parts, and they, they had no qualms about showing those body parts in their nakedness. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. But it's, I mean, they knew what they were doing. And so this is the context into which Paul is speaking. And he's dealing with people who were brought out of that idolatrous lifestyle and all that goes with it. So it's not merely the figure, it's the image in the mind. I gazed upon an image of a female goddess partially clad and saw the swell of her chest. And I, you know, I kind of gazed on that. And now I have that in my mind when I close my eyes. And as I look at every other woman, I'm imagining that. This is where guys like Keller and others are, you know, picking up these things of, you know, idols of the heart, idols of the mind. But, but in Paul's era, we're dealing not just with idols of the mind, we are dealing with the literal physical idols that are made out of earthly materials. And so Paul says to the Corinthians, I do not want you to be unaware that our fathers were all under the cloud and passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And they ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. So they were getting a foretaste of Jesus in Moses is a way of summarizing that language right there. And yet... Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And Paul says, and these things took place in his example for us that we might not desire evil as they did. That's a, that's a very pregnant phrase. We could preach a whole sermon on that one verse. But their overthrow, their death, their confutation is meant as a warning to us believers in the New Testament era that we not desire evil in its many forms. And there are many forms. But Paul is now talking specifically about idolatry. So he says in verse 7, Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now this doesn't mean to like play tennis or basketball. This is sexual play. They, They rose up to have an orgy, to, you know, have a big sexual party. And why, by the way, would they have done that? because they'd come out of Egypt, where that sort of thing went on, where they had an idolatrous culture in Egypt. So even though they they were the people of God, after 430 years of captivity in Egypt, let's just say that their Jewish sensibilities were pretty eroded. Mm. So they were more Egyptian in their behavior and their appetites and their thinking than they were, in this case, Jewish. And by the way, similar concept, Paul speaking to the Greeks, but he's saying, you Greeks in Corinth, you know, you, you have a long history and you don't want to make the mistake that they made. And then it says, we must not indulge in sexual immorality. Ah, ding, 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 ding. There's that word. And in our last 
podcast or a couple podcasts ago, whenever we did it, uh, we were talking about Acts 15 and the stricture against sexual immorality. So here's Paul picking that up. We don't want to be idolaters is what he says first. That, by the way, was also in the Apostolic Council decree of Acts 15. So here's Paul re-emphasizing the very things that they had been agreed upon in, in Jerusalem at that council that is recorded in Acts 15. So no idolatry and no sexual immorality. Some of them engaged in it, apparently quite a few of them, because 23,000 fell in a single day. 23,000. That's a lot. You know, we're living in a time of COVID as we record this, and I don't know what the latest number is, but I think I saw 90,000 this morning. So maybe I'm off. But 23,000, that's like, you know, sort of a quarter of a COVID for the whole United States of America. Yeah. I mean, th I'm, I'm just trying to put this in perspective, the gravity of this situation, the seriousness of it all. And then he says, we must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did. They were destroyed by servants. Now, we're going to return to the idea of testing Jesus. So I'm not going to dwell on it yet. I'll come back to it. But I do want to put it on the table. Many of us are testing the Lord, and we don't realize we're testing the Lord. Mm -hmm. And in this case of the people in the wilderness, they fell because of it. They died in the wilderness. The serpents bit them. And God had to rescue them out of it. And so they get this bronze serpent. They look at it, and that becomes their point of faith, their touch point of faith. And so everyone who looked at this thing, it became known as Nahushtan. In the end, um, you know, they get healed. So God had to do something to rescue them. And even that something is reminiscent of Jesus. It's a foreshadowing of Jesus himself. Yeah. So all healing, all freedom, all deliverance, ultimately it flows through Jesus. But they didn't yet have Jesus. They just had something that would be evocative of that. But then it says, uh, among other things, don't grumble. And some did, and they were destroyed by the destroyer. Okay, well, some sort of destroying angel came among them because of sin of the lips. That's worth something. Right. Okay. And then, uh, and then he says, verse 11, now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the ends of the ages have come. What's Paul saying? What happened to them could happen to you. And he's writing to the Corinthians. He's writing to Gentile Christians. Most people that are listening to this are Gentiles. Maybe they have some Jewish blood that got mixed in somewhere, but they're Gentiles. They live like Gentiles. Their sentiments are Gentile. They're not Orthodox Jewish people. And so these things were written down among Jewish people as an example for Gentile people who are living in a pagan polytheistic world. This is what Paul is saying. Right. And then he goes on, he says, let anyone who thinks that he stand take heed lest he fall. So you may think you're getting away with it. You may think you're so clever, but just watch out. These things have a way of rising up and biting you in the butt. And then he goes on and he talks about how temptation can come up and there's nothing that can uh, come up that God doesn't somehow provide a way out. But of course, this means you need to select that way out. You have to choose that one. You can't just continue going down the path that leads you to destruction. But right. then after having said all that, verse 14, he says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. So my conclusion, my, that's what therefore means. My conclusion, based on everything I've just argued, is that you need to stay away from idols. And he says, I speak as to sensible people. I want you to judge for yourselves what I say. I want you to weigh this. I want you to think about the, the reasonableness of all that, I am, all that I am writing to you. And then he makes us an argument that may not be immediately obvious, so I'll unpack this. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Well, he's talking about the communion cup. And he says, the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? He's talking about the broken bread of communion. So he's saying when you eat the bread, when you drink the cup, you are participating in Jesus. Now, we could have a big discussion about whether it's transubstantiation, real presence, uh, you know, spiritual presence. I mean, there were different positions people have taken. It's an interesting argument. We're not going to have it right now. I just point out that whatever it means, Paul is saying that when you partake, you are participating in Jesus. And he says... Um, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So by partaking of one bread, which symbolizes Jesus, we are drawn together and we become one body through Jesus. But then he says this, consider the people of Israel are not those who eat sacrifices participants in the altar. Now, he's going back to Old Testament times, and he's talking about 
the burnt offerings of the ancient times. And he's saying when they would eat the meat that came out of the sacrifices, never mind the organ meat, because we already covered that in another podcast. But when they eat the meat, by eating the meat, they are partaking in Yahweh. They are, they are joining themselves to Yahweh. This is the spiritual significance of all sacrifice. And this is why I teach on sacrifice as I do. You wouldn't know this as a Westerner because we don't do this in the West. But if you go to Erie and Jaya, if you go to wherever, Zambia or Mozambique or <coughs> Uganda or Zambia or whatever, if you go to India, if you go to places where they still offer sacrifices, it is clearly understood that when you bring a sacrifice and lay it on the altar, you are participating in the power of the altar, which is empowered by the demon spirit that is behind the altar, maybe not literally behind it, but empowers it and makes the whole thing run. This is what happens when, when offerings are made. And this is why when we deliver people the spirits that they picked up through offerings, they need to be they need to renounce and be delivered of the spirits that entered them by eating the sacrificial meal. It's the same principle whether you're worshiping Yahweh or you're worshiping Matsu, the god of the sea in Taiwan. Identical principle. If you partake of the altar, you are partaking of the god and that god's power. That's the principle right there. So let me let me stop because this is I've heard this multiple times. Yep. Uh, from other people talk about paul then in romans where it's romans uh eight and he talks about um it not being basically there's no let's see i can i can tell you um let's see he said i know that i am persuaded in the lord jesus this is 14 uh that nothing is unclean in and of itself um uh, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean wait a minute wait 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 8 14 doesn't say that you've got the oh, wrong chapter 14 wrong romans 14 14 oh 14 14 okay um but he goes on this whole um kind of a a a passage about uh there's really nothing behind it It is is kind of what he says is therefore let's not pass judgment on one another rather decide uh, to never put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother uh i know i'm persuaded by the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in and of itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. Um, and then you skip down to uh, verse 16 says, so do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Yep. And, he, and it's kind of talking about, he, he again says, listen, if it causes your brother to stumble, don't do it. Um, which I think is a great argument. That's the love principle. Right, in and of itself. And so what I've heard from other people pushing back on on this would be like, well, see, he's saying it's really, there's nothing behind it. It's just a cultural uh, a cultural thing um, to do. Not at all. Paul would make the same argument if, if it were relevant in the passage to the Romans that he made to the Corinthians. Why? Because Rome was equally idolatrous. And in fact, in many cases, they took the Greek gods and just renamed them with Roman names and worshiped them as is. The principle here is what we were discussing in Galatians. Is it kosher or unkosher? Nothing is clean or unclean. But the context in 1 Corinthians is different. 1 Corinthians 10, he's talking about idolatry. This isn't about idolatry. This is about, can you eat the chicken liver? So if I were, I mean, I don't eat it anymore, but if I were still eating chicken liver and I got around, say, a Jewish person, although Jewish delis serve it, but a Jewish person who had some sensibility about this and said, well, you know, that's actually reserved for priests. Uh, excuse me, it's reserved for burning to the Lord. And so we shouldn't be eating organ meat. You shouldn't be eating that at my table. I wouldn't eat it. Now, like I say, I don't eat it anyway. But, but in an earlier time when I was still eating it, I would have said, oh, well, then I'd desist from eating it. So this is, this is the very language. You have to look at what the language is. Nothing is clean or unclean, but, but something could be idolatrous or not idolatrous, and idolatry is explicitly forbidden both to New and Old Testament Christians. Well, there were no Christians in the Old Testament, but you know what I mean, Old, uh, believers. Yeah. New Testament believers, Old Testament believers. Well, so that we have to watch what the language says, and he's talking about unclean. And, and honestly, the tiebreaker, if there is one for me, is is in revelation 
uh, Jesus specifically says that he hates these teachings that are leading people to eat the meat sacrificed to idols. Yes, I mean, precisely. Jesus says he hates it. So to me, it's right. like, done deal. <laughs> so let's go back to what Paul says, because I was going to go there, but you beat me. So we'll just, re we'll just capture it at the end. So Paul says, when you eat the meat that's laid on an altar, you participate in the power of the God that backs the altar. He says, what do I imply then, that food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, and this is explicit, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. Now, most Western commentators, and 90% of the commentaries that have ever been written are written in the West. Why? Because we're literate people and educated people, and we like to write commentaries. It's not that there are none that have been written in you know, Uganda or whatever. Just the, it's, it's a vast minority compared to the preponderance that comes out of Western schools and seminaries and whatnot. But Paul says what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. And with that, he is, he is actually referencing a passage in Psalm 106, verses 36 and 37, which says that the people of Israel, they became beholden to the idols and they sacrificed to the demon gods when they sacrificed to the idols, Baal, Molech, Ashtoreth, etc. And so Paul is, is drawing on that. Now remember, he's arguing to Gentiles. He's not talking to Jews here. So food that is offered to, uh, to idols in pagan rituals is actually sacrificed to demons. And then he says, Having, having made the comment that if you eat the food that's on the altar, you participate with that God, he says, I do not want you to be participants with demons. What's he implying? If you go into the temple of Hera or Zeus or Pluto or whoever, and you partake of the offering that is offered on that altar, the spirits that empower that altar, you will be partaking in those spirits and you will become demonized by virtue of having done so just as if you were partaking of Yahweh's altar, you would be a participant in Yahweh. And Paul says, you cannot, it's actually, I mean, it does literally say cannot, but the force of the argument, the logic behind it is not that you literally are unable to do it, but rather you ought not to drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons, and you ought not to partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons, because if you do, you're going to have a war going on inside of you. you. On the one hand, you're supposed to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. And on the other hand, you're demonized because of things that you yourself did. And he says, now back to this idea of provoking the Lord to jealousy, which I called out and said, we'll return to. It says, um, shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Who's getting jealous here? God himself. Because if we do this, we are, as it says in the Old Testament, it's a language we don't usually use in church circles, we are playing the whore. We are, we are committing adultery against the Lord, and we will incite his jealousy. And he says, are we stronger than he? Well, clearly not. And then he goes on, and he says, so if you, if you are at someone's house, and you find out that this food has been offered in sacrifice, I'm jumping down to verse 28 to end this, this bit of teaching then do not eat it, because you are morally culpable once you know that the food has been offered to an idol. And so with that, we, we, we can't eat meat sacrificed to idols. We can't partake in the things that, that, are, of, um, that are of demons. And, and we have to understand the spiritual reality beyond what we see with our eyes. It may just look like a statue, or a carving, but it's actually something more than that. And the reason people don't get this is because they are spiritually dull. Isaiah even speaks of this kind of situation, and Jesus quotes it. Uh, be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Be ever hearing, but never understanding. And Isaiah's commission is preach and make this people's heart hard, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, turn, and are healed. These things are very clear in scripture that we can actually become hardened by not heeding the clear instruction of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus says, and I hate what's going on 
because they are teaching people to eat meat sacrificed to idols. That's in Revelation. That's the last commentary on that we have in the scripture. So clean and unclean is one thing. Idols and no idols is a totally different thing. And really, is that the basis for us to think about uh, demonization? Because, you know, as far as this meat sacrifice idols, like we may not see that here every day in our in our context, but the the theory behind the idols being empowered by the demons, it, whether we're eating physical meat or not, when we begin to partner with those idols in whatever way, we begin to open ourselves up. That's exactly correct. And this is what happens. Let's move it to the generalized sense, you know, the, the idols of the mind and the heart that you brought up whenever, 20 minutes ago. Uh, so when somebody looks at pornography, what are they doing? Well, they are idolizing the human body. And, you know, we know what happens when people look at pornography. They don't just happen to look at it. Other things happen too. And so they are partaking of something. And a lot of times people who have done this end up demonized. I'm not saying they're not going to heaven. They may be going to heaven and be completely bound. I mean, I don't think it's victorious living at all. But, um, but I do want to say it is possible for people to live above pornography, to be free of it. I don't look at pornography. I'm not even tempted by it. So I, you know, it, it is conceivable that yes, this can actually happen for people. But many times the reason people feel that overpowering thing that they cannot resist is because they are demonized. They may be demonized in their mind. They may have spirits attached to their genitalia because of self-stimulation. They may have spirits attached in other parts of their body because of acts that they carry out. Having watched pornography, it makes you want to do all of that. So, you know, whatever body parts get involved, many times when we're getting people free of this, we have to drive demons out of their hands or their lips or their nose or their ears because, you know, all of these parts of the body are in one way or another involved in sexual acts. And so this is probably more than most of our listeners are accustomed to hearing. But I mean, this is the way it really rolls on the front line when you're actually doing deliverance with real demons, not New York Times demons that are just in your head. Uh, and you're getting people free of these bondages that they cannot seem to break free of. This is what really happens. And so, so then let's go back to that illustration. So uh, pornography would be an idol that's empowered by lust and, and all of that. And so there, that would be sort of the gateway for those demons. It wouldn't just be lust. Lust would be on the list. But, I mean, we could have lust. We could have uh, licentiousness. We could have impurity. We could have masturbation. We could have, you know, there's a cluster of demons of that sort. And the question is, is it one there? Is it three there? Is it 20 there? Uh, don't know until we sort of get in and start clearing it out. And then we get a pretty good sense of what, what's been going on. And so the basis for us is we're going, maybe the theology behind uh, demonization really comes from that teaching of, of the idols and eating meat that's sacrificed to God bounds us to him. And then eating, eating from the fruit of the idols I mean, that's kind of where it all is, is being. That's correct. Right. Because that's exactly correct. I think one of the things people say is like, where, you know, where is it in the scripture, uh, you know, that you can have a demon of pornography inside of you or whatever. And, you know, it obviously doesn't say that verbatim. Um, but I think it's good to know this is sort of where um, we, we sort of get our theology of, of demons. That's right. Not all demons that can be in people are named in the Bible. There are many more demons than are named in the Bible. But there are, if you read the Bible with the right eyes and you understand what you're hearing and, and seeing, there are many more demons that are listed in the Bible than you, than you might think. Now, I'll, I'll just I'll call one out right here. The book of Hosea, I, I counted them once and now I can't remember, but it's, it's well over a dozen times and, and I, I just can't remember the exact number at this moment, but the book of Hosea over and over again speaks of a spirit of whoredom. Now, a lot of times people would say, especially a Western commentator with a non-supernatural worldview who understands nothing of demons and deliverance. Um, so somebody who's, you know, sitting in a, in a seminary kind of a environment, they'll say, well, that's just an attitude of, you know, straying from God. No, it's actually more than that. It is a spirit of whoredom and it causes people to wander and become bound so that they almost can't help themselves. And they do stray from God, so there is that dynamic. But with it, there is whoredom that comes upon a nation, 
and with it gross and licentious physical sexual immorality as well follows on the idolatry. Now, this is pretty much the substance of Paul's argument in Romans 1, where he talks about how God gives people over to base desires and things that ought not to be done. Why? Because they did not worship and serve the Creator, and instead worshiped and served an idol. So again, we're back to some of the same concepts that we've been talking about. It's all found right there in Romans chapter 1. And people read it and they go, that's just Paul and his homophobia. No, it's not Paul and his homophobia, because he's talking about way more than homosexuality. He's talking about heterosexual immorality. And if you look at America today, you look at the way our people live, you look at the way even Christians are, with the amount of sexual immorality, people caught with pornography, people having premarital sex, people saying, well, I have needs. Listen, I... I'm not that old, but I can remember a time where there where in general people had some sense of it isn't right, it isn't proper, I ought not to be having premarital sex. And in the 1960s, according to the best studies that are out there, 90% of women who got married were virgins on their wedding night. In in our in today's world, it is 10% of women. Excuse me, 5% of women. I misspoke. 5% of women who are virgins on their wedding night. In the 1960s, 70% of men were virgins on their wedding night. And today, 5% of men are virgins on their wedding night. Something has shifted. Our culture, and I'm talking about heterosexuality here. I'm not even, I'm not quote unquote gay bashing. I'm talking about heterosexual Christians. And I'm saying, Christian, if you are doing this stuff, you may well be under the influence of a spirit of whoredom or pornography or impurity or masturbation, or whatever other things you've been into with the many partners you've had as you've dated your way, hopefully, to the altar. And, and Paul even says, because there is so much immorality in his context, speaking to the Corinthians in their polytheistic Greek society, still coming out of all that that had put in their hearts, he says, if you cannot keep yourself, it is better to marry than to burn with passion Each one should have his own spouse and keep his own vessel in holiness and in honor. And so it is very clear in the scripture that the way we are living as an American civilization is completely dishonorable in the eyes of God. And, you know, I I don't want to condemn, but I really want to call this out because it is a national travesty that we live as we do. Mm. There's a lot of externalities that come with it, too. You know, we talk about externalities in economic theory. Well, you know, when you burn coal, you get, you know, CO2 emissions and soot and smog. Okay, those are externalities. What's an externality of the immorality of our society? How about, well, they have various names. They used to be called venereal disease. Now we call them STIs, and we've dumbed that term down from STD, sexually transmitted infections and that sounds nicer than a sexually transmitted disease, but, you know, we don't want to condemn people. But, you know, if you don't ever have those kinds of problems with immorality, you don't have to worry about STDs and STIs. How do I know this? Because neither my wife nor I has ever had an STD or an STI. It just didn't happen. Well, that's interesting. Okay, and someone's going to say, well, you know, you're just a prude. No, I'm following God. I'm following because what he commands, he does for our benefit. So we can talk about that as an externality. We can talk about abortion. And, you know, there's been over 60 million babies aborted in this country, and I'm aware of the rape and incest argument, but that's a red herring. The vast majority of abortion in America happens for one single reason. It's used as a morning after or a week after or a month after or three months after um, birth control method. And so that is an externality. Then here's another one. If the person, if the woman decides to go full term with her child, now we have children being raised in homes where there is no father figure, and yet God designed that we should have a man and a woman in that child's life to give them nurture, love, correction, protection, um, money, clothes, food, you know, all of that. But we have children who grow up as latchkey kids, waifs, orphans, wastrels, whatever term used to be used when those words were still allowed. But, but we have children who are being raised in a way that is ultimately not in their best interest, and they, generally speaking, do not rise to all that they could in terms of their full potential, whether educationally or professionally. Yes, I'm aware some people do fight their way out of the hole, but, but I'm talking by and large. 
These are three giant externalities of the Im immorality in, in our society. And I could go on, but I'll stop there. No, I think that's good. And I think, um, I, I think where we're going to go from this and we'll, we'll wrap this episode up and go into uh, sort of a rapid fire uh, of different uh, hot button, uh, which you, you've already just, you know, stomped all over the, the big one of, uh, of sexuality. <laughs> But we'll go into a couple of more issues uh, over these next few episodes uh, that I know people um, will want to uh, want to hear. Ken, thanks, and we will uh, um, we'll, we'll get into the next one uh, here shortly. God is not a theory is a podcast of Orbis Ministries. For more information about Orbis Ministries, go to orbisministries.org. If you have questions you'd like to have Ken answer on the podcast, please send us an email to podcast at orbisministries.org. Thanks for listening.